uh, in this lecture, uh, I will discuss um, uh, a few key uh, aspects uh, and uh, will find some, some essential concepts uh, regarding uh, nationalism. Right? Uh, and we will have to define this term as well because it is usually misused, but you will be asked to be careful not to confuse the term nationalism with, for example, patriotism. It's not the same thing. Uh, why is this uh, important? Well, it is important, first of all, because it is a key aspect of politics in Central and Eastern Europe, but not just, not just. Uh, it is misleading to think that way. But since we're dealing with that uh, region, it is uh, a key aspect of that region. And it has to do with this uh, issue of, um, that we have dealt with in the 19th century, right? When you talk about the 19th century, which is nation building and state building. Uh, remember, these are two different things, right? Uh, the state is a set of institutions with sovereign power over a territorial membership. It's a set of political institutions, right? That's all there is, right? That define a territory of exclusive sovereignty, right? Meaning that the, the modern state does not accept any rivals, right? Uh, whether internal or external. Uh, and also defines a membership, meaning this is the mem these are the members of the state. And it usually is, defines them through this tool that is citizenship, right? It accords, it gives a specific, it gives a membership Right? Citizenship is a membership in a state, in a state, right? So it defines who can get it and who cannot. And those who, who, who are members, the state institutions, right, uh, give them certain rights and certain duties. They can call them to arms, they can uh, tax them, but they also give them some protection. So that's what a state is, right? Now, nation is something completely different. Nation is a group of people united by a fundamental identification. Uh, that's all there is, right? Now, by what? What are those fundamental identifications, um, uh, characteristics of identity that differs from national self-definition to national self-definition? And uh, now you see, right? Uh, and we have studied these terms. Now you see why uh, nation is not the same as state, but you also see why these uh, the the very idea or concept of nation becomes such a prominent thing in modernity. Why? Because in modernity we also have this idea that uh, a state must represent uh, that a state uh, state power needs to be connected to uh, to the people, right? That a state needs to be of a specific uh, uh, population, right? Of a specific people, uh, and all of them should be equally related to the state, right? This idea that of uh, what I'm defining here is this idea of a nation state, which is an abstraction. An abstraction that doesn't correspond with the reality on the ground or to uh, at any point in history, right? The idea that there is um, these neatly uh, enclosed groups, right? Uh, and each of them has their own set of political institutions. That they, that's not how human beings have lived ever, right? So, what, when you, even when you have things that look more like a nation state in which the nation corresponds with statehood, it's actually a result of a process by which things, differences have been eliminated, groups have been assimilated, excluded, cleansed, ethnic cleansing, right? And just, if you think of the United States, you know that you can, uh, you see how this has happened, because even when the Declaration of Independence was proclamated, right, it was the independence of this group of people which were the European colonists from the eastern seaboard, okay? That was the nation. The, native population who was actually had a claim to the territory was not even included, not even thought of. Right? So it is an exclusionary right, uh, definition, right? And, and as, as this, uh, when this group proclaimed statehood, which remember is a, is a claim to sovereign, autonomous, exclusive power, and that statehood started expanding throughout the continent, right, because it was just this niche on the, on the east coast, what did it do? It pushed all the other populations away. The native populations, right? That there's a, there's a, there is, you see in action, a process of state building, right? Uh, and, and a national self definition that is clearly exclusionary. It's not everybody is in, it's very clear a group, right? Um, and let's not talk about the African Americans, right? Which it would take until the 1960s for them to become full citizens, right? And even included members of the nation. And there are other layers of the discussion that we can talk about, or think Canada, uh, right? And so on. Okay, well, I'm not going into that tangent too much, but just to give you an example that these are not remote things. It's just that if we don't recognize them, it's, it's because we are, uh, 
well, <laughs> we take for granted certain processes of nation and state building, but all modern states have gone through this process of nation, of, of state building and separately nation building. Uh, all modern states have done that, okay? And this is just, um, if, if, if they become less apparent, it is because, uh, well, we're not reading them carefully, right? Or maybe we are at the end of the process, right? By which time all the differences have been uh, erased through ethnic cleansing, through exclusion, through whatever, through assimilation, and so on. You know, think about, and I'm going to you know, conclude the example with the, uh, of the US with this, think about the, the fact that, oh, everybody talk, uh, speaks English, right? Well, what happened to all those ethnic groups that, that spoke different uh, languages, right? Um, why not speak several languages at the level of the state, you see? That, so it's an interesting situation in which even a, a politically defined nation, as the United States is, in which membership in the nation is actually membership in the state, you are American because you are a citizen, so that's a politically defined nation, right? Because it's a political tool that defines who is who is member of the nation, right? Even that it's, is actually very strongly imbued with national, with national culture, with ethnocultural aspects, right? Because we're saying it doesn't matter what language you speak, whatever ethnicity, race, you can be American because you're a citizen. That that's it's a political definition, but it's not quite true, is it? Right? Uh, it is not quite true because uh, let's say let's let's say that a large population of uh, Spanish uh, you know Latino uh, Spanish speaking population will demand that the government also uses Spanish. Well, you will you there will be backlash to that, right? Well, why not if language is not doesn't matter, right? Why not have the the, the all the uh, papers, all the administration, the United States federal, state, and whatever use also Spanish as the second second language? There is no official language in the United States, and yet there is, is there? Legally, no, but in practice, there is. Uh, because at the level of the administration, you know, uh, the claim to use different languages would be, would receive a backlash. So you see how, how, how you know, things are, are a little bit more complicated than, than, than they seem, right? So, um, getting back to, to, to our, our subject here, the point is, Right, that nation building is a process through which that state building is a process uh, through which uh, these institutions uh, of sovereignty are built. Right, uh, you set up a set of institutions and they establish sovereign control over the territory. And um, for example, you know, in, in Colombia or Mexico, uh, different points in the last twenty years, you had uh, moments when not all of the territory was under the actual control of the government. So there were rival groups that actually had autonomy, sovereignty there, right? Northern Mex Mexico, some places with gangs. Uh, literally, there was no central government. It was the government, right? It was governed by local power holders, same in Colombia, right? So that's, you know, state building has to do with building that. Nation building is the process of defining who's in and who's out, and based on what criteria, on this thing called nation, right? And it's very, uh, you know, it's very... Uh, Complex, and I gave you to just to you know, <laughs> to use the example that I already gave you, right? I gave you, uh, and I mentioned Canada, right? Why is there a Canada? Right? Well, in 1812, there was an attempt to take over the Canadian province, right? Which was a actually it was a colony at this point, uh, because I mean there were 30 colonies that formed a state, and yet there was another one not north of them that didn't want to form a state with them, right? So, in 1812, a few years after independence, of, of, after these colonies building a state, so state building, they wanted to incorporate the northern provinces, as they did with the rest of the continent, by the way, westward and southward, because, you know, they moved from this niche on the east coast towards and conquered the rest of the continent through the various means. So, they tried to do that. So, clearly, there was no question that, oh, are they part of our nation or not? It wasn't even a, a, a matter. It was a ba basic thing. It's an exp territorial expansion, state building and action. And they failed because the war, they failed in the act of war. If they would have succeeded, then it, that would also have been part of the, the state. But they have failed. Right? So, uh, does this mean that, you know, uh, what was the national identity of these people who were part of this state, south of, uh, part of this state constituted of 13 colonies versus that colony to the north, Canada, that wasn't, 
did it, were they of different nation or the same nation? You see, the, the question didn't even come up. Because it was the process of state building, and once you incorporate them, you're just going to include them all, oh no, no, you're part of this nation. Uh, and, and just to put, you know, the, to give the reverse angle here, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, uh, well, let, let's just finish the discussion there. <laughs> there, there you, the point I'm trying to make here is that these processes that we're discussing, right, we, we should be able to recognize them in the reality that surrounds us. Because every, as I said, every single modern state has gone through this process of state building and nation. Now, in Central and Eastern Europe, this happens in a very specific way. And the reason why it happens in a very uh, specific way uh, is that national nation building, national self-definition happens around ethnocultural lines first and foremost. First and foremost. There is a political dimension, but first and foremost ethnoculture. And this is the famous discussion between ethnically defined nation or ethnoculturally defined nation and politically defined nation. A very simple explanation of uh, these two definitions are an ethnically defined nation is that the criteria, the common criteria that unite the group that constitutes itself into a nation are ethnocultural. Meaning, those who respond to these criteria, such as language, uh, history, but again, history is like a histor historical story, right? Doesn't necessarily have to be a real history. So, language, history, common memory, traditions, uh, uh, culture, high culture, low culture, meaning folk culture, uh, religion, region, geography, so all of these, right, can be put together, even some uh, uh, phenot phenotypical um, some resemblances, phenotype, right, for example, being blonde, you know, blue, uh, blue eyes, you know, that's a phenotype, right, so all of these can, or, or co combination of these can be used to define what is a German, right? But when you use this sort of ethnoculture, because it has to do with ethnicity and culture, right? Um, uh, criteria, right? Then you define nation, na the nation, this group, based on ethnocultural uh, criteria. That's one example, one end of the story. The other end is a politically defined nation in which the group the, the commonality, the common identity that these people share is not ethnic, ethnocultural, but it is political. It's by belonging to a set of political institutions, um, associated with a set of political institutions that creates that nation, right? And the typical example for this is the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, France is a typical Britain, right? In which you are, uh, you are French or British or Canadian because you are a member of the state, because you have citizenship, basically. So it's this thing, the state, that defines, the state exists and then simply says whoever is in is part of the nation. Right? Uh, or, but this is happens because at the moment when the nation is defined, the state already exists. And that was the case of France. France existed as a state, unitary state at the time when this, this question of nation and state building arose in the 19th century. So it was easy to say, okay, everybody here will be part of the French nation. Now, was, notice that this is a construction, this is an invention, this is a building of something. Because many people here spoke different languages, had different traditions, didn't want to be part of this French thing, nation. They were made part. Assimilation, just like the Native Americans were made part, even if they didn't want to. And just like other ethnic groups, you know, were made part and they would have to speak English and whatever in the United States, even if that's not part of the official definition of what an American is. Assimilation, it, it doesn't mean, because it's politically defined, doesn't mean that it's not, doesn't include assimilation, it doesn't include forced change of culture and so on. It always has a cultural aspect, okay? But it's still politically defined, meaning that once the criterion here is not officially, the language, the color, whatever it is, you have to belong to the state and that makes your nation. And it's very, that's, that's the idea, right? An ethnically defined nation is one in which, and this is why they, it's a criterion, is because in Europe, France what is in the lucky situation that it, there was a state that then could be the defined nation. In the rest of Europe, however, that wasn't the case, because human beings have never lived in such a abstractions, right? So, um, in the rest of Europe, you will have multinational empires, right, fluctuating borders and so on, when we, we studied that, we looked at these various variations of this. So, in those cases, there is no set 
borders that have con continuity in time based on which now we have to reclaim that no, no, everybody here is French, will speak French and so on, whether they want it or not, by the way. So here you'll have the opposite process. If here you have a state, so a set of institutions, defining a territory and then defining everybody who's in as part of the state and as part of the nation. So it's a state in search of a nation, a state defining the nation. And that was the US when it was founded, Canada, Australia, France, UK. Here you have a nation being defined first and then claiming statehood. So an ethically defined nation is usually a process in which uh, it's, it's a nation in search of a state and this is a state in search of a nation. And all of this happens because we have this idea, the modern idea, that each state has to be a state of a people, of a specifically defined people. Why? I don't, I don't know why. It also has to do with democracy, funnily enough, because we have to govern ourselves. But who is self? Because we are all human beings. Should there be one government of the entire globe, right? <laughs> so, that's the modern idea. But in order to have self-governance, which is the essence of the modern state, the state of a people, nation-state, hence we use this absurd word, uh, we need to make this connection between state and a group of people united by a different set of characteristics, between state and nation, which are two different realities, again and again and again. So this is done either by the state existing and defining them the nation, or by the nation existing and then claiming the state, defining the state. So the nation is, uh, is, is, is constructed and defined as, okay, here's this nation, we are the German nation, this is it. At this point, they're part of this many states, of various types, because that's how people have lived throughout history. Right? This is how they are today. But in, now they say, no, no, we need the German to make a German state, one. Why one? We don't know. That needs to, needs to govern itself. Why? Why? So now they claim self-governance means that they define the state based on the boundary of the nation. The state will be defined based on the boundaries of the nation. A nation in search of states. Nation defines state. State defines nation. Political defined nation, ethically defined nation. But notice, none of this is just that. There is a large part of politically defined nationhood here as well, because once you define this, you realize, wait a minute, there are many people here who are actually not ethnic Germans. Of course, because there's no such spaces of pure, uh, pure uh, ethnicity. Furthermore, there is no such thing as one German hood. Germanic tribes have been of many types, and even today, you know, in today's quote-unquote Germany, there are many dialects, and you might not be able to understand them, even if you're German speaker. Okay, this modern concept that there are some uniforms; these are Germans, these are French. That is a modern construction. Things have never worked that way. Diversity is much deeper and much more local, and identity and tradition and so on. Okay. Uh, Okay, so both have aspects of the other. This one has very strong cultural aspects. And again, think US, English language, uh, you know, and whatever. Uh, this one has political aspects because suddenly, once it has a state, this new state will also claim that everybody inside, even if they speak a different language, suddenly would be, would be said, oh no, no, you're part of this state. It, once it has claimed the statehood, it will turn back and define everyone inside as members of the state. Okay. And that's what we saw in the conflict in, in, in former Islam. Now, uh, here, we get to another key, key concept, the, the concept of nationalism. Now, this is, a, again, a very misused concept in common parlance in the United States, for example, right? We, actually, we use it interchangeable with patriotism. It's not very clear what it means. It's good, it's bad, but it's okay. Now, we need to clarify uh, some distinctions that, um, for example, your textbook doesn't make, but I need you to know and, and to use them differently. Because they, as you see from what we're reading, the situation is much more complex. 
So let's define two different things here, two different concepts. Nationalism versus patriotism. Notice that both of these, and this is the secret of the power of, of these things, uh, are still linked to this paradigm, this modern paradigm that the states, the modern states, belong to, 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 to the people. They are associated, each state is exclusively associated with the people. So it's my state, my country, uh, which, by which I mean state, by the way, not country. In the Middle Ages, when they said uh, country, my country, my homeland, they referred to the region, the valley, the, the village, the city where they were from. That was the homeland. Okay. Now you see that we automatically associate them with states. The United States is a state. France, whatever. Why? Because we have been educated that way. Why? Because this is part of identity. And this is why these, these things are so powerful. Right? Why bother so much about this? Why not? But again, here's my question. Why not abolish all states and have one global government? Because, listen, everybody's human being. Oh, no, no, no. We need to have our own. When you say we need to have our own government, you mean that there is an us that is very different from them. Why? What would be the, cr the criteria based on which you will say us versus them? And here's where all these discussions of national building, or nation building, of defining nation, comes into play. Because you include some, and you exclude others. Or let me give you an example. You know, since, uh, you know, Florida used to be Spanish, let's just give it back to Spain. Uh, that's the fact. That it, and it was conquered, right? Well, no, because it's, it's, it is now ours, or it's United States, is part of... But if these are not relevant definitions, if this is not important, then why cling to such things? Or what if most people now speak are of uh, Hispanic or Latino descent in, let's say, Florida or Southern California? Why not let them be part of a different state, a different country, right? Whether Mexico or a different thing, right? Why not? Well, no, it's ours, right? It's us. But says who and where, right? Because it has been part of the historical process of expansion, actually. So, you know, that happened, expansion happens, retreat can happen, whatever, right? You see how important, how these things touch on, item, on, on uh, layers that are very powerful, because it's part of identity. Because each of us is enculturated, it is educated to understand himself or herself as a member of a, you know, of a group, that is smaller, larger, and so on. Um, and the standard group nowadays is, at a certain level, it's no longer the city, which used to be the standard group, or the region, which used to be the standard group, or Christendom, which used to be a standard group. And I understand why it didn't matter if borders changed, because you're still European, Christian, who cares? And everybody who, who's cultivated speaks Latin and whatever. Who cares which specific border you're part of? But now, no. Now we define ourselves. The, 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 the highest, one of the highest levels to which many of us define ourselves, you might or might not, is nation. Which is, again, a construct, not a result of certain uh, concrete processes. Okay? But you see how powerful it is, because it defines identity. It is about who you are and who you are not. Who you have learned that you are, who you, who you, have, you have incorporated that you are, or you have not. And then you associate the, the institutions of the state as your institutions. They, they are yours. It's my state. It's my country. Which, by the way, is a state for, you know, why not your valley? Why not Kilitas Valley? Why isn't that your homeland? You see? It's an arbitrary limit, because it could happen, you know, that this is a country, you know, this, this big, you know. Why not? Looks Luxembourg, you know, whatever. That is a state. Not larger than probably Tilda's value or whatever, not uh, Liechtenstein. Okay. So, uh, does it have to be large or small? I mean, you know, why Canada? Why not Canada? Why not this being part of Canada or Canada being part of this or whatever? Okay. It's part of identity. This is why they're so motivating. This is why clarifying these concepts is very, uh, very important. And let me first clarify patriotism. Patriotism, let's define patriotism as, as, a, as a, uh, a feeling or a type of pride, comfort, attachment towards what is identified as a community uh, of belonging, as the same as you. 
And that's usually associated with either one's quote-unquote nation or country. But notice it is a pride, belonging, attachment, familiarity. I, am, I feel at home because we share a culture, by what, by, and by that I mean I speak a language that they understand, not necessarily the language, because in England, England they speak the same language, same language Australia, whatever, right? But I speak uh, the terms I use, the, 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 the experience, uh, the, the reference points are the same. We relate to some of the same uh, events or values or ideas or whatever, so I feel that, you know, at home. But the homeness is part of this sort of, uh, part of this idea that I, what I communicate and what I get communicated to me is, is part of the same system of simplification. I understand and I feel understood. Right? You see how, how important it is and how it touches upon identity. So is this awareness of belonging to a given shared, uh, you know, space, cultural space, right? That's patriotism is comfort, pride uh, and, you know, willingness to sacrifice for that. It's important to define patriotism this way, as a feeling of pride and comfort and dedication to, uh, well, a degree of dedication to one's community of belonging, versus nationalism. And let's define nationalism as, as, as a, nationalism is an ideology. Nationalism is more than just patriotism, like being ready to, feeling, that you have a community of belonging of whatever, you can be patriotic towards your city more than towards whatever else, right? Um, and being willing to do something for that, sacrifice yourself or whatever. And nationalism, which is an ideology, and remember in the hard sense. Remember how we define ideology in the hard sense, right? We define it as a moral theory, right? A moral theory that defines tries to define what is right and wrong in this world, clearly, uh, and, and eliminate evil through, through political means. Well, nationalism puts the nation above everything else. Puts this construct of the nation as the highest moral value. Now, notice it is not a moral value. The fact that you belong to this or that nation is not a morally thing, morally imbued thing. Although you might put here a parenthesis and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, how about the idea that we're the best in the world and whatever, right? But let's stick with this. Uh, puts the nation as the highest moral value. So belonging to whatever nation is a good, is a good meaning a moral good, right? A moral good, as it, and which means that belonging to other nation is a lesser good or even evil. Okay. So so good and bad are evil and good are suddenly defined by criteria that are not moral. And remember that's part of what an ideology is. It's not actions that you choose, but you are, because you are French, you're a cheese-eating surrender monkey, right? Wasn't that the, the, the saying during 10 years ago, okay? Because you're French, as if that is a moral category, right? As if belonging to certain cultural or state, belonging to a different state is a moral, is a moral, has moral value more or less. You see how these sound familiar, right? But a nationalist, that, remember, an ideology is very active, very aggressive. It tries to, if we are good and they are bad, the solution to our problems is eliminating the bad. Now, usually, you don't bother much with this because uh, uh, in the modern, with the modern nation state, usually the bad are abroad, uh, you know, abroad, you know, uh, beyond the borders, so you don't have to bother with them. But what if they're not? What if they're not? What if you're in the process of nation building and you have competing nationalisms, competing national groups, all of them consider themselves to be good and the other ones being the obstacle to their happiness and felicity, and all of them competing to define their own state. And now you see that I'm, I'm talking about former Yugoslavia, where you have competing national groups claiming their own statehood in an area that where such exclusive, unitary nation-states based on ethnic criteria cannot be built. Cannot be built. Okay? But then how, where do you remain? Where does democracy remain? Where does democracy remain? Well, we had Yugoslavia and we saw, right? <coughs> right? That it didn't work. Right? It didn't work as a multinational state. Because, you know, Democracy means my, I need to be able to speak my language in administration, but why not the other language? How much of this language? How much of that language? 
Well, why not just speak the other language? Yeah, why not just speak Spanish in the public administration in the United States? Well, wait a minute. We can't do that. Right? You see how it applies everywhere. Right? So, um, nationalism then becomes this, this, uh, is, is this ideology by which the nation becomes a moral value and everything that opposes it becomes the enemy. And the ideal, the utopia, is when the nation will have its own state and govern itself. That's why nationalism appeared in the 19th century, because it was during the time when nations were claiming states. In the process of this modern, of building the modern state, of modern state building, and of modern nation building, which happened at the same time. Because you, you had to define states to claim na uh, uh, nations to claim states, or states claim nations, because we established this world of people who are finally free and govern themselves, but which people? Again, the solution would be, let's eliminate our borders, the whole globe is one humankind, have one government. Oh, webs, no. Because which language will we talk about? What language will we speak? Uh, right? Why not my language? Why not my dialect? And so on, and so on, and so on. Okay. Yeah, it is a conundrum, right? So, nationalism puts one's uh, associates higher moral value to one's own nation, that becomes a moral value and identifies an external threat, them, uh, them which is uh, uh, endangering the us, and thus becomes the evil. So the solution becomes for us to win and for them to lose. And the highest moral, the utopia will be when we win and we eliminate the them who, who need to, to, to lose. That's, that's, that's basic nationalism. It's a moral, that, it's a moral system. Uh, it's such a powerful moral system because, remember, it, it talks about your identity. And if someone tells you, your nation is actually socks, you're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Right? You don't like to hear that. Of course, it's a, you know, it does the opposite thing. You know, it's like, a, again, that person would do the same mistake, would associate a moral value to something that has no moral value intrinsically. Just because you're a member of a state or the other doesn't make you morally doesn't tell anything about you, right? But that's what the ideologies do. They use non-moral criteria to define morally individuals. So let's define that. So uh, let's differentiate that between patriotism, which is this comfort and pride in one's identity, uh, or one community, one's community of belonging, and enjoy being, you know, whatever, Czech. With nationalism, in which being Czech is the greatest thing ever, and we're just oppressed by the Poles and the Slovaks who don't let us be whatever we want to be and whatever. Okay, you see the difference. Uh, okay. And here's another concept that, that is very useful in our discussion. And that is the concept of cleavage. And which your book does not mention. Uh, Cleavages. What are cleavages uh, in, in uh, political, as a political term? Uh, a cleavage in a society is a deep and enduring differentiation between, uh, between different groups of, of, of people. Deep and enduring differentiations that are unbridgeable gaps between separating uh, groups of people. Okay? Um, so let me give an example. A cleavage can be linguistic. German speakers versus Czech speakers, okay? But, and here's the other, here's the thing. Cleavages can be overlapping and cross-cutting, okay? If the cleavage is overlapping, that means that you have, if you, uh, based on language, you have two groups. If you apply the, the language cleavage creates two groups, German and Czech. If you apply, and it isn't an abstract uh, you know, example, so it doesn't really apply here. So, by language. If you apply the religion cleavage, meaning that's not a cleavage that differentiates groups of people, in an overlapping, if in the case of overlapping cleavages, religion will also create Catholic and Protestant. And again, it's an abstract uh, example, right? So, German speaker, Czech speakers, speakers by differentiated by language, differentiated by religion, Catholics and Protestants, differentiated by region, can also be a cleavage, west and east, 
differentiated by what else? Uh, can we, uh, economy, rich and poor. What do you see here? In the case of an overlapping cleavage, all of these fall along the same fault lines. You see that whatever distinction you take, you always get the same two groups. And these differentiates, differentiations just reinforce themselves, which means that the, the ditch is, is, is deeper and deeper and deeper, the gap is deeper and deeper, which means that there's no, there's no overlap here, right? Uh, there's no, uh, uh, there's no, the cleavages overlap, right? The, the cleavage means the, really the ditch, the line of separation, right? Uh, let me give you the example of cross-cutting cleavages to, to clarify, okay? If you divide a society by, by language, you get German-speaking and Czech-speaking. If you divide the same, like this is a society, if you decide, divide the same society by religion, you will get Catholic and Protestant. If you divide them by region, you will get, I don't know, North, West and South East. If you divide them by economy, you will get rich and poor. What do you see here? You see that someone can be German, Catholic, uh, I don't know what else is <laughs> rich, Northwestern, but also Czech, rich, Catholic, and Northwestern. The point is, these different types of divisions don't produce two separate groups, but produce, over, produce groups in which these types of identity, because what are we talking about, types of identity, uh, you know, are not distinctly separated. So one can be Czech and be what? Uh, poor and be uh, Protestant and be Southeast uh, and whatever we have as a criterion of, of, uh, of definition. And you can be German and you can be poor and Protestant and Southeast. Why is this important? Because if this is the case, these, for, to take the simplest example, the Protestant and the Czech will meet in church. Because they're both Protestant. They're not separated physically. Okay? They're both poor, they were meeting line for social security. They're part of and they live in the same place. The only thing that differentiates them is the language they speak. So they are united by all these other things. However, in, a, in an overlapping cleavage, which means that the cleavage is the differentiations fall one upon the other, which means that one they are differentiated along the, several lines, simply then you'll have Germans must be rich must be Catholic, must be <coughs> in the West, and whatever else uh, criteria we use, and Czechs are all poor, all Protestant, and all Eastern. They never meet. Literally, these people live here, speak a different language, go to different church, they are different, and uh, these people do everything else differently. Which means that how do you create a common society out of this? You have two societies. While here, because you have this these, di these differences, you know, the differences, uh, the different groups, you know, uh, combine, different identities combine, you have, it's much easier to create and have one society. Because if I don't encounter this person in, in school where I speak in Czech, but I will encounter him in church, I will encounter him in the breadline, I will encounter him in the market, because I, I live, he's my neighbor. I might be German and speak German, but I'm actually Catholic and he is Protestant, so we, you know, we meet here, but we live in the same area or not the same area, and so on. The point is that this mix is what makes the, the possibility of, of having one society because there's no clear division. National self-definition will then not fall up along these cleavage lines. And why is this an important thing? Because in societies where you have such deep overlapping cleavages, and still you have one state. Now notice the, the, the difficulty here. Especially if one of these groups is much larger than the other. Because democratically this group will tend to have all the power, right? Because they vote, you know? So they will get most places in the government, so this group will be a minority. And obviously the majority will want to speak German, will want to, whatever, impose the Protestant values or whatever it is. Ethnic minorities will then have to negotiate with the majority, try to get their uh, uh, compromise.
compromises to try to get benefits from them which might or might not work. And might decide to, you know what, let's succeed. Let's make our own thing. Or even more so, maybe there is a state right next to them which is their uh, a state that has all of them are Czech and Protestant and poor and in, on the East. So basically they say, you know what, let's unite with these people here. Okay. And it's, you know, it's an abstract model, but I mean, the example is abstract, but the case that we're talking about is Yugoslavia, isn't it? Because these are the Serbs in Bosnia. And you have another minority, the Croats in Bosnia, with Croatia. And here are Muslims, and actually that's not even true because they don't live separately, because they live in this intertwined situation, don't they? So now you see the problem. Right. Now, you see, now, you see, now you see the problem. And the problem is... A problem of, you know, this tension between nation building and state building, right? which goes deep to it identity and goes deep to 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 to, to what is perceived as as, as individual and and and, uh, and group rights. We need to have our own state to be happy and so not to be oppressed by uh, uh, by the others. Now, let's apply these principles of nation and state building, let's, let's just take these, these concepts that we have des described and let's apply them to the entire Central Eastern European region after 1989. And I will continue in the second part.